Hello, I'm Marites Vitu. Welcome to Southeast Asia Speaks. This is the show where I get to interview resource persons and newsmakers on issues affecting the region. I will be speaking to Eric Jensen, professor at the Stanford Law School and director of the Rule of Law Program. He helped launch the Afghanistan Legal Education Project in 2007. We will be talking about the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan, what to expect now that the Taliban have taken over. And this is also a timely interview. It has been 20 years since 9-11 happened. And Eric will share his thoughts with us on the 20th anniversary of 9-11. Thank you so much, Eric, for making time for this interview. I'm de delighted to be here with you, Mary Tess. Always. Yes, I think... Yes, I think we should start from the beginning. <laughs> when you visited Afghanistan in 2002, that's close to 20 years uh, to today. How was it then and how has Afghanistan changed? I mean, just a broad picture for those of us yeah. who really haven't watched it closely. Yeah. Uh, Afghanistan has been exposed to the outside world over the last 20 years. Kabul has been radically transformed from a sleepy town to a bustling city. It went from about 300,000 people to well over 4 million people in the city of Kabul itself. And it went from uh, no cell phones to now at least 70 to 80 percent of Afghans have cell phones. Uh, on social and educational statistics, a lot has happened. Both maternal and child mortality have been reduced by half. Life expect expectancy has increased by nine years. The status of women in Afghanistan is still low, but I cannot tell you how much better it is today than it was when I first visited Afghanistan in 2002. Girls' education has expanded dramatically from almost nil uh, when, to, when the Taliban fell to approximately 40% of girls attending school pre-pandemic. My favorite time of day in Kabul was late afternoon when girls would get out of school and walk home in twos and threes, uh, as you might see in the Philippines, uh, in conversation, sharing a joke and having a, a chat. So that means that the 20 years that the U.S. was there together with other uh, Western countries had brought successes to Afghanistan. Yeah, they're unremarked successes, but they're uh, substantial successes in, in education and basic health statistics that uh, development professionals like me look at. Um, it, it was starting from a very, very low base, which was a, a problem. Uh, human resource capacity was weak. Afghanistan remains a weak state. Um, it, it's quite different, and maybe I should say this now, it's quite different from state building in Germany where you had a very well-trained bureaucracy, or in Japan, where likewise you had a very well-trained bureaucracy post-World War II. In Afghanistan, uh, after the Taliban fell, the state capacity was unbelievably weak, one of the weakest in the world. And not, not the, the framework of a bureaucracy to build a state on, that had to be created. So now that the US uh, forces have withdrawn, do you expect, what do you expect to happen to all, I mean, the successes you've seen, at least they were already start the improvement in um, women's situation, maternal health, life expectancy. What will happen? Well, um, let me give the dark side first. Some of this okay. hinges on, some of this hinges on whether uh, the Taliban uh, seek and uh, achieve international recognition or whether they just decide to, to go the way they did uh, before they fell uh, early in the century. The dark story is that poverty now is uh, at 40% plus. It will rise. Health statistics will plunge. Education, especially for girls, will plunge. And really without recognition of the Taliban by the international community, we may even see famine, starvation, and a true humanitarian crisis. So um, what went wrong then, Eric, uh, with the U.S. intervention? I, I know that you've read that you were interviewed and you were against the withdrawal of the U.S. forces from Afghanistan. Yeah, there's... there's I know a, it's a big question, what went wrong? Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's uh, I, quite, quite a few things were... Uh, I, Went, went wrong, I would say it would have been a complex uh, 
it would have been a complex project, even if uh, things hadn't gone wrong. But we we find that, um, you know, actually there was a um, the uh, uh, the larger project's shortcomings were in in timing, pursuing uh, and and getting to, going into Afghanistan and then being distracted by uh, Iraq. Um, the military mission was a, a confusion. It was initially a mission to take out Osama bin Laden. Then it became a, a larger development project, a counterterrorism project. There was some development stupidity uh, involved, trying to construct a very vast uh, panoply of state institutions. Um, we were dispersing enormous amounts of money on weak Afghan institutions that did not have the absorbed capacity and to leaders who were or became corrupt, such as Ahmed Karzai and Nashraf Ghani. Uh, they undermined the legitimacy of the government in the eyes of both the public and, and the military. Now, I, I can turn to the U.S. and what went wrong in the U.S. domestically after the intervention. Uh, now we're in an environment where both parties are pointing fingers at each other, but every administration since the uh, invasion of Afghanistan has made big mistakes. Two Republican presidents and two Democratic presidents. Uh, in the first administration, the Bush administration that went into Afghanistan, and I supported that, uh, he diverted attention and resources to Iraq immediately thereafter. And I was always against going into Iraq. It was a, it was a conjured up war that didn't need to happen. Uh, and uh, for those of you who are interested in, as a matter of history, take a look at Colin Powell's argument at the UN before going into war on February 5th, 2003. It's laughable on the face of it, it's extreme credulity. The most surprising aspect of the U.S. case on weapons of mass destruction in Iraq is that it fooled a host of foreign policy pundits and Republican and Democratic politicians. Uh, so that was Bush's uh, uh, sin. He was an original sin of, um, of uh, uh, diverting attention to Iraq. Uh, President Obama uh, implemented a surge in troops in 2009 with simultaneously announcing withdrawal date before the 2012 election. Now, no one who has taken courses in negotiations or just has a, some practical sense knows that you, you can't announce withdrawal and still maintain the, the credible leverage you need in a negotiation. The Taliban have always said, uh, you Americans have the watch, but we have the time. And uh, uh, so they were just waiting it out with Obama's surge. Then uh, in the Trump negotiation, he negotiated an agreement that had a withdrawal date, again, another withdrawal date, with no confidence building measures and meet conditionalities that uh, following it. The Trump agreement and the process of negotiating it showed that the U.S. just wanted to get the hell out of Dodge. And I think it was a clear signal, not only to the Taliban, but also to uh, the Afghan military, that the U.S. was indeed just going to leave. Uh, so. Uh, the initiative ne to negotiate with the Taliban is right, but the negotiations were deeply flawed. And then finally, uh, when uh, the President Biden came to power, he treated the Trump withdrawal agreement as a binding constraint and failed to renegotiate uh, its terms. The Biden administration has dismantled all sorts of regulatory measures that the Trump administration installed. So the question arises, why then did President Biden feel constrained by Trump's withdrawal agreement? The truth is he didn't, but it was a convenient excuse to get out of Afghanistan, something that he had wanted to do desperately since certainly before uh, uh, 2009. So I, I, I ticked through this list of misdeeds on the political front just to illustrate that every administration uh, had an equal opportunity to uh, make major mistakes and all of them did. Okay, so at least now we, we see the, the big picture and I like what you the phrase you use, development stupidity? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's not appreciating what's happening on the ground. And you said there were so many um, activities going on. But anyway, in an interview, a very in interesting interview you gave, Eric, you talked about a myth. And let me read the myth that you talked about. Sure. The myth that international terrorist groups have migrated out of Afghanistan 
to other regions of the world. So what is the reality? <laughs> well, uh, the reality I know in, in uh, uh, the Philippines continues to struggle with its, uh, 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 its war on terrorism, but uh, it was, um, there was a claim uh, right as uh, the Biden administration announced that uh, terrorist, terrorism networks had migrated out of Afghanistan to the Middle East and Africa. It was used as a partial justification for withdrawal. But that claim is not correct. And it fails to appreciate how terrorist groups operate. Inter international terrorism criminal networks are highly nimble and they, they migrate to safe havens as they pursue targets of opportunity. And these multinational terrorist networks exist in Afghanistan. And now they will thrive. An estimated 20 terrorist networks are currently operating in the country. Shortly after the U.S., I, I don't know if you all remember this, the U.S. dropped the mother of all bombs on a maze of terrorist-occupied caves in April of 2017. Shortly after that, I had dinner with the Afghanistan's Deputy National Security Advisor. And he told me that at the time, only two of the three major caves had been cleared, and the deceased included at least 15 nationalities. Now, uh, in the future, we can expect these networks and activities will expand. And it is hard to speculate whether those activities will reach American shores. However, it is possible, if not probable, I would say, that those activities will further destabilize Southwest Asia, South Asia, and Central Asia. We'll see how it trickles to Southeast Asia. I hope it doesn't. And when you think through these scenarios, it becomes quite plausible that those activities will affect American business, diplomatic, and security interests. So yeah, I think the, the, um, uh, the idea that international terrorist groups have migrated out of uh, uh, Afghanistan and that, that uh, fertile region is, um, is, is total bunk. Yes, and another myth that you debunked in this interview is this, the Taliban have a unified that is completely separate from ISIS. Again, uh, what is the reality on the ground? Well, I, you know, if <laughs> you're, you're quoting an interview I did, I'm going, in, in this interview, I'm going to quote an interview that, that my friend, uh, uh, Lieutenant General H.R. McMaster, uh, gave to MSNBC on August uh, 26, uh, 2021. Um, and, and this was uh, in response to a question about how frequently in the U.S. I would say the press tries to, to create uh, uh, barriers between terrorist groups, like the Haqqani network is separate from ISIS, is separate from the Taliban, is separate from Al-Qaeda. And uh, uh, HR said, uh, we try too hard to disconnect the dots of terrorist networks. These groups share people, resources, and techniques. And I can't agree more with, with that comment. Indeed, one should be very skeptical about the claim that clean organizational lines divide the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, and the Qani network from ISIS and other terrorist groups. These networks, uh, for lack of a better term, they metastasize, and the ways in which they collaborate and compete are frequently not clear. So uh, let's go back to the present now in Afghanistan. What do you think should the international community do or should they intervene? There is discussion of sending peacekeeping forces. But what can the international community do now? Yeah, um, the, my answers are incomplete to this. I think it's an actually a, a very difficult question. But certainly uh, uh, pressure with economic uh, conditionalities uh, around human rights and women's rights. I think is, is absolutely there. The Taliban have formed their interim government. There's not a single woman on, on, on that, uh, uh, in that cabinet. So pressuring, uh, we have significant economic leverage. The state of Afghanistan is dead broke. So we've got to use that economic condition to leverage other minimal concessions that, that we find absolutely necessary. And even though uh, the US government and other governments um, have been trying for years, I think we've got to continue to pressure Pakistan with economic sanctions to stop its clandestine support of a, a destabilized Afghanistan. Pakistan has always 
viewed uh, Afghanistan as a country that it needs to control for its strategic depth because it is so paranoid about India. It feels like it'll be squeezed if India gets a significant toehold in Afghanistan. I actually don't see that happening, but the, the paranoia in Pakistan persists. So these two things, pressuring with economic conditionalities on, on Afghanistan, on the Taliban uh, coalition government, condi uh, in transition government, excuse me, and pressuring Pakistan with economic sanctions to uh, stop its clandestine support. Yes, I'd like to turn our attention now, Eric, to what you've been doing in Afghanistan. You started a legal education uh, project, a program, and and can you tell us a bit about it? Why did you do? Why did you choose legal education, and what have you achieved? So, um, I think I'll spare you the whole genesis of uh, the legal education project that started in Afghanistan. Maybe we can return to that, Mary Tess, but. Uh, the reason uh, I turn to legal education is, I guess, to a certain extent, we do what we know, and I, I know law. Uh, but Afghanistan was and is a weak state. Uh, and building the capacity of the state, particularly its bureaucracy, is key. Now, not to be too academic about it, but Frederick the Great in Prussia realized this, and he built his bureaucracy on the backs of trained lawyers. Also, legal education... Is a, is a way to develop critical thinking skills. It's not only it's a really good environment in which to develop those critical thinking skills that can be applied in a number of jobs that are necessary to build the state. Okay, so uh, what will happen to your program now, Eric? Uh, will you continue it? What's the status? Uh, one of one of my one of my favorite uh, Indian philosophers is Ashish Nandi. And uh, Ashish once said, uh, our inability to imagine alternatives is the surest guarantee of oppression. So my uh, stock and trade for years and years has been working in difficult countries in close collaboration with, with uh, nationals of the countries in which I work. I mean, very close collaboration to figure out how we might imagine a different future. Um, the, I sit on the board of American University of Afghanistan. We are now in conversations with a number of regional universities uh, and universities in the U.S., figure out, figuring out ways to continue our mission to educate Afghans, including and particularly women. Uh, we will be a university in exile for the coming period, but we have a lot of support to continue our mission. I don't want to go into details now since uh, we are in a very dynamic period figuring out our future. What I can say is that we as a board of American University of Afghanistan are unalterably committed to our students, making sure that they can graduate and flourish. Uh, Eric, we have a comment from one of our viewers uh, from Facebook, Imelda Peraga Portillo. She says, time to end the 20 year war. And I remember that you also uh, wrote about it or talked about it, that the, um, it's a myth that it is America's longest war. Maybe uh, in response to Imelda, uh, can you share your thoughts on this myth of the longest war of America? Sure. Uh, Imelda, I think that um, 60 to 70 percent of the American public agrees with you. Uh, and indeed, that's, that's why you saw, uh, I would say that, that was the driving force in pulling out of Afghanistan. Frequently, when journalists talk about uh, America's longest war, they use aggregate numbers. They say uh, $2.26 trillion, trillion and 2,400 plus American uh, uh, soldiers and those hired by the Pentagon have lost their lives. That's a large number, but if you look at last five years, do you know how many people have lost their, their lives, how many American soldiers have lost their lives? 66 over five years. So I would argue that for the last five years, this hasn't been America's war. This has been Afghanistan's war. And indeed, they've lost tremendous numbers. 47,000 plus uh, civilians, 66,000 plus soldiers. 
It's been Afghanistan's war. It's not America's longest war. Uh, in fact, America for the last five years, I would argue, it's looked much more like a stabilization program than it has a war from America's perspective. But believe me, 60 to 70 percent of the American public agrees with you. Um, I will, I, I'm going to jump into this because one other myth that I've, I've recently written about that I, I hope um, actually uh, comes true, and that is that there will be less loss of life uh, with the Americans pulling out, less loss of blood and treasure with the Americans pulling out than it would have been had the Americans stayed in. And I'm not so sure about this. There is something in foreign relations uh, called the boomerang effect. Uh, and we saw that in Iraq. When the US pulled out of Iraq suddenly, ISIS grew, reared its ugly head and became the biggest terrorist organization in the world. Now, I, I hope something like that doesn't happen in Afghanistan. But if it does, we will be revisiting this issue of whether there was greater loss of life and blood and treasure with the Americans uh, pulling out than with the Americans staying in. Oh, uh, yes, Eric, in relation to what you've discussed earlier about imagining you know, um, alternative realities or what can happen without the U.S. there, do you still have hope that stability and peace can will eventually come to Afghanistan? You know, Mary Tess, on a, on a political level, I can dream certain things. Um, one, one pathway to a durable peace would require the active cooperation and collaboration of very disparate civilian political leaders. Uh, that sort of unity is unlikely, but if it happened, it could inspire better performance uh, across the board in government, uh, reconstituting a military that, that actually felt like it was fighting for something that wasn't an utterly corrupt machine. Uh, together, they could present a formidable force for a tolerant and peaceful future. But many, many prior conditions would have to align to make that possible. And at this stage, I think it's remote. I think, you know, the Taliban might be able to achieve a level of peace and stability, but it's hard for me to imagine that they'll be able to do that with about, without excessive amounts of repression. And I can speculate about how long that, that, uh, that path uh, on repression would last. Uh, then I think we would be looking at civil war and some very, uh, very bad options going forward. Well, maybe for the final question, Eric, of course, that's a very uh, sad uh, prospect for Afghanistan. But for the final question, uh, can I ask you to share, us, share with us your reflections on the 20th anniversary of 9-11? I mean, this is all uh, related to what has happened in Afghanistan. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, there's a lot of commentary about this in, in the U.S. today, but I'm going to make my reflection very personal. Um, when 9-11 happened, uh, what I saw was a, a coming together of a nation in crisis. And uh, George Bush talked about, uh, you know, we're, we are a beacon of, of freedom and, and hope in the world. And I, I, I look 20 years down the line, and I actually believe that to a certain extent. I, I, know, I know the flaws, and I know many in this uh, audience in the Philippines know the, know the flaws of, of U.S. foreign policy extremely well. But uh, I was proud of the way the country came together afterward to, uh, to do the things that, that we needed to do to stabilize our country, and um, initially to uh, seek out perpetrators of uh, international uh, terrorism. But so in, 20 years ago, the greatest threat to the U.S. was from beyond its shores. The greatest threat today is from the far right in the U.S. I was struck by the parallelism between the insurrectionists who stormed the U.S. Capitol on January 6th of this year and sat in the seats of, of, uh, of Congress and the Taliban who entered the, uh, the palace in Kabul just a couple of weeks ago and sat at a presidential desk. And following that, if, if that wasn't uh, vivid enough, uh, now right-wing American groups have actually expressed support for the Taliban. It's an upside-down world. 
And I'm very, very worried about the the greatest uh, domestic, uh, the, the greatest threat we have of uh, uh, terrorism in the U.S. is homegrown terrorism. And I never thought I'd see that. And I never thought I'd see the the threats to democracy and rule of law that we've seen over the last uh, four or five years uh, in America. So uh, I'd like to end this this interview on a on a positive note, and maybe I can say, you know. There are cycles in history. Political scientists are not very good at anticipating these cycles with any precision. But maybe the pendulum has swung so far to one way in America politically that we will see the pendulum swinging the other way, where people in, the, in a major party, that is the Republican Party, actually standing up and saying, 9-11 wasn't a figment of your imagination. It really happened. We are really under uh, threat, and we don't care if this is going to cost us votes in the next election. I hope that we can see that political courage in, in the U.S., and I hope then again we can also be an example for the rest of the world. And until we fix our own house, I don't see that happening. Wow. Thank you so much, Eric, for that thoughtful uh, reflection on 20 years after 9-11. And to our viewers and listeners, thank you for keeping us company. We will continue this conversation because Afghanistan is not going to go away. The issues that the country faces. And maybe some Filipinos may think, what do we care? But uh, this is a country in, in Asia, Central Asia, that uh, I think has ripple, whatever happens has ripple effects also on ours. So thank you, Eric. And we hope to uh, talk to you again. And thank you very much for your time. And bye. Bye. Most welcome, Mary Tess. My pleasure. Good evening, everyone.